I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times, and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. It's the start of the school year, and today we'll be discussing the challenges facing teachers, parents, and students with Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers. Recently, she spoke about the proud history of the March on Washington, and that now, 60 years later, the struggle for equal opportunity isn't over. She stood with unions other than her own to show solidarity. And of course, as the new school year is about to begin, she recently launched a new program, Real Solutions for Kids and Communities. Randy Weingarten is the president of the AFT. She joins us now from on the road where she's opening schools across the country. The teachers union has 1.7 million members. And Randy, uh, schools are opening in New York shortly uh, and barring a school bus driver strike. What can we expect in the new semester in New York? So New York, um is gonna have some new things for the first time in I would say a very long time. Uh, uh, the uh, chancellor and the, you know, the teachers union um, have worked hard this year to completely revamp, and they worked hard this summer to completely revamp um, the literacy programs to actually make sure that, um, that reading was fun is fundamental and that there is a real science to reading as well as a love for reading you know too many kids and you know i've said this nationally as well too many kids are not interested in reading books part of it is that books don't have you know don't look like them and they're not titles but the other part of it is that that we are not really focusing on helping kids um with the construction of reading, you know, sometimes it's called the science of reading, with learning vocabulary, with understanding, with context, with decoding words, with putting words together. I'm sorry to be so pedagogo today, but those kind of things are really important. And it during COVID and particularly during the, um, you know, the virtual moments of COVID, you could see that we really lost ground. So the UFT, David Banks, they have revamped three curriculum, new curriculums. We are working with them. We actually um, launched a new website to help teachers called Reading Universe. It's completely free to teachers and to parents. And so that's going to be a big new um, uh, initiative in terms of the New York City public school system. And how will we know whether that works? I mean, could we measure that ultimately in <laughs> test scores? Uh, are gonna, people going to be taking more books out of libraries, uh, reading books online? How do we know whether any of that is successful? We've been through so many uh, incarnations and iterations of phonics and other forms of, of reading improvement. What, what is, right. How do we measure success? Well, I, I think you can, you know, it, I'm so glad you asked that question, Sam, because, you know, there's data points that measure success. You see this in Mississippi, where with the Barksdale Institute, who's working with WETA and us on this new Reading Universe website, Barksdale worked really closely with Mississippi. Um, I saw it, we represent the Jackson teachers, I saw it in Jackson, and I was, I became a really big believer after watching this. Um, and over the course of time, you see that, that Mississippi, which is a really poor state, and does, and frankly, the inequities are huge, and you just have to look at the water system in Jackson. So I'm not lifting up the Mississippi, what's happening in Mississippi, except to say that this work, when you really work with teachers and work with parents, really works, and you see long-term their reading scores have gone up. You need to do two things. You need to actually create a joy of reading. That's why the AFT, get, as others are banning books, we give out books. We're up to 9 million books we've given out. By July 2024, we'll be at 10 million. We do these huge different uh, book giveaways. We're doing one in Harlem in a couple of weeks. So it's the joy but it's the confidence as well. So you can see it in reading scores, but the real thing you can see it in is kids being happy in school. 
is kids actually understanding and having confidence about going to school and reading is the first piece of it. And the other place you see it is look at the huge differences in poll results between parents and people that don't have kids in schools. Parents really, really love and need what public schools do. 90% of them send their kids to public schools. And the rest of the world kind of doesn't really get engaged enough. So they are swayed by, you know, what the extremists, you know, have said about the schools not doing as good a job as, as they are doing. Should we do better? Of course. But I think you're, you'll see it over a couple of years in reading scores, but mostly you'll see it in the confidence of young adults. We all know statistics could be skewed. Uh, we studied enough math in school to know that, even if it turned out not to be all that <laughs> useful in other cases. But 90% of parents send their kids to public schools. Is that because they don't have enough choice? Um, well, look, the last polling we did on this, um, and you're seeing it in all, there's a, there's a whole bunch of new polls that have come out, Navigator, um, uh, Gallup, both in terms of back to school as well as in terms of la labor. But we asked that question directly in a poll we did last January. So really close to when there was still high anxiety about you know the transition from um, COVID to non-COVID, and we and eighty by an eighty twenty split. When you say to parents, "What do you want? More choice or strengthening public schools?" and they say strengthening public schools. Now, I would actually argue we should we can have public school choice in public schools, and we should do a, be doing a lot more, frankly, for our high school graduates or our high school, um, our high schoolers to open them up to um, experiential learning and to career what, what paths. What is experiential uh, learning? That's a, you're being so pedagogical. You, sorry, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Career tech ed is the best example of experiential learning. I call it experiential learning because we have to deal with the stigma of you know, what people used to think about vocational schools. Mm -hmm. There are 2,500, 2,200, Skills USA sh show us, there are 2,200 um, monetizable certificates that are available to high school students and you know, maybe dual enrollment programs in terms of community colleges. And it's not just welding, it's culinary, it's safety in kitchens, it's cybersecurity, it's IT, it's becoming a Microsoft technician, a Google technician, all of these kinds of things. But it's the debate um, that I did in AP history for my kids, the we to people debate. Experiential learning is hands-on learning. It's mm -hmm. practical skills. It's working in teams. It's application. And frankly, it's a whole heck of a lot better than what we do when we have kids sitting in a seat and trying to do well on a test score. And particularly in this, in this AI, generative AI generation, when it's not going to be memorization of facts, but it's going to be application of knowledge, mm -hmm. experiential learning is really important. And this is the big, so, so if we had, look, we have magnet schools. We have great um, career tech ed schools in New York City. We don't have enough of them, but like the Harbor School, like the STEAM School, we have huge healthcare shortages. We have this new labor market demand that's being created by, you know, all the work that Joe Biden did in the Inflation Reduction Act, in the Infrastructure Act, on chips, on infrastructure, on health care. Why don't we, and this is what I mean by choice and by um, experiential learning, why don't we make sure that in high schools, kids are exposed to a whole lot of choices of career and college and why and and so we give them many many more choices in public schools and in a place like a big school system like New York City a big school system like Chicago you can do all these kinds of things and and this is the this is what happens when you do that let me ask you about 94% let me yeah, let me just ahead. give you the this, sure. this stat 94% of kids who go to CTE programs graduate from high school on time and 70% of them go to college. 
So when we talk about choice for kids, that gives kids a lot of agency and a lot of choice. And when we start doing these programs, we saw, for example, in New Lex, Ohio, a rural area in Ohio, their graduation rate shot up from like 50 or 60 percent to 93 percent when they started giving kids these kind of experiential learning and these kind of choices. That's why I'm a big believer. That's part of our Real Solutions campaign. I'm a big believer. We got to do literacy. We got to do these kind of things that make schools fun and align it to the jobs of today and tomorrow and the skills needed of today and tomorrow. And we also have to address loneliness and mental health. Okay, I want to ask my question and go into your 3L uh, instead of 3R program uh, right <laughs> after we come back after this break. We're talking with uh, American Federation of Teachers President Randy Weingarten, the new school year starting in New York and all over the country. You mentioned uh, Joe Biden before. You've been a big supporter of his, both because of his education policies and his support of organized labor. Let me ask you a question specifically about migrants in New York City. We've got something like 20,000 of them coming into the city school system. Many of them can speak English. Is the federal federal government doing enough to help the mayor of New York, the city administration, the state administration in terms of absorbing, assimilating migrants coming from other countries? Look, I think the federal government should be doing more and than they're doing. I agree with Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams that they should be doing more. I think we have a fundamental um, issue here. It's, it's not immigrants that are, you know, replacing Americans in terms of jobs or in terms of any of these issues. Um, it's th that we don't have the kind of Congress that works together to have a really, to have a comprehensive um, immigration plan in America. Chuck Schumer attempted to do this years ago in a bipartisan way. It got stopped. Um, and the and uh, migrants have become uh, a political issue. I mean, if you look at the Statue of Liberty, um, and I just I'm going to talk personally about my family. My family migrated from Ukraine. All the people who are coming into uh, America right now, the refugees in particular, they are migrating for America is a country that normally or used to welcome migrants and and we are a country of immigrants. So should we be doing more? Yes, we should be doing more. Do we need to actually deal with issues like how to help migrants get work permits, how to get the funding to assimilate into schools? Yes, we should. But part of this problem is that the Congress, particularly the House of Representatives, um, would much rather make this a political issue. Um, these governors in Texas and Florida would much rather make it a political issue. So there is not the kind of um, leeway in regulation or in statute that the president needs, that the governor needs, that the mayor needs to um, create um, workforce um, possibilities. We are all familiar with the three R's. You've been talking lately about the three L's, learning loss, literacy, and loneliness. What can teachers do about all three of those? So number one, I mean, that's part of the reason why we are doing this solutions campaign, because teachers right now, it defaults to them to do everything. <laughs> you know, I just saw a statistic in the last couple of days that we have a shortage of about 100,000 mental health providers in terms of schools that we really need. And, 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 you know, if you look at the American Rescue Plan, we have the funding for it. We need about 100,000 more, and, and, and we don't have them. So it defaults to teachers. Teachers end up feeding kids. Teachers end up being, um, you know, surrogate aunt and uncle and coach and things like that. So we have to call out the effects of what has happened in terms of the pandemic. The pandemic really created disconnection. And then on top of that, the social media companies are pretty irresponsible about um, 
about putting their profits over children's safety. So you have a loneliness issue. And you also have, because of this connection, this disconnection, you got a lot of kids that are not coming to school and you have a lot of kids that are disconnected from school. So that is that has that has um, created or or kept this learning loss issue, and and parents are concerned about it. So call it out, and then have the solutions. So teachers do this all the time. They deal with this all the time. What I'm talking about is let's have some systemic solutions that we know will work that we put into schools all throughout America to help. So wrap services around schools. So you wrap food services around schools. You wrap mental health services around schools, like we see in Upper Harlem at the Cha School. And we have about 2,500 of these schools already in the country. Let's do more of this so we have services for families and services for kids to really deal with loneliness. And second, this experiential learning piece that I'm talking about, make schools fun, make it interesting for kids. That, so they want to come and they see something for themselves, not just a diploma, as important as that is, but they see that they, they have something that interests them, like media literacy, like we were just talking about during the break, like, you know, um, you know the, the, one of the schools in New York, I love graphics arts, it has a tilapia um, farm in the basement. It has an herb garden in the in the um, you know on the roof. Have a culinary program. Have healthcare programs. So so we have several solutions on literacy, on experiential learning, on mental health to really address the issues that kids are bringing with them to schools. The issues that families have. That's what schools should do. So that's why I call it. Let's address loneliness, learning loss, and literacy. Let's not hide it. Let's address it and, and give teachers the support and parents and families the support they need to actually make sure that kids are thriving. Why is loneliness an issue now? And how do you deal with social media companies who are there to make money? How do you deal with them to encourage them to uh, deal with this issue in a constructive way? So, you know, Europe is doing a much better job about this than we are. The European Union just passed um, some digital acts that prioritize children's safety um, above profits. And there's regulation. Look what happened with TV years and years ago. There was regulation about, you know, you can't be factually incorrect. I mean, some of that regulation went by the wayside. There had to be, um, you know, an ability to give both sides. There was um, regulation about radio. There's regulation about trade. There's regulation about seatbelts. So their social media companies can have more regulation that prioritizes um, the kind of work that they do. We put a, a, a we put a plan together. Parents and educators and the American Psychological Association, which I released in July. Um, and there are 10 things that these social media companies could do right now in terms of changing their algorithm and changing their coding. They could do it this afternoon and it would make things better for kids. So when they tell me they can't do it or it's just that they won't do it. So I'll give you three examples. Mm -hmm. Number one, you could make the default position um, so, so, so you could make, you could put the default position in terms of setting up any social media platform, make it at the highest level for children's safety. So you have to change it, um, manually if you want to lower the controls. That's number one. They could do that right now. Number two, get rid of automatic scroll, get rid of it. This constant scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, it's addictive. So, you know, kids, so a parent, they're not going to see what their kids are doing all the time. Number three, stop notifications during the school day. Just stop them. If you stop new notifications during the school day, there's less of this addiction for a kid to go back to and look to say, oh, do I have something new? Is there something new here? So automatic scroll, 
infinite scroll, these notifications, it is part of the addiction of somebody constantly going back to look at their computer or to look at these things. Those things you can do. You can also change the algorithm because what happens for kids, take Instagram. You know, a kid looks and sees, you know, some other kids speaking, um, some, you know, beautiful teenagers looking beautiful in bathing suits, a kid, a, a girl stops. The, they know, the social media platforms know that somebody stopped and then they start feeding that kid um, things about obesity, things about how that kid looks. And that's part of what they need to change. That's because true. that's what that's what that's what hurts. That's what helps create this. Oh my God, I'm not as good as what I'm seeing in the in the picture. And a social media company knows this because they know when somebody looks at something and sticks with it for a few seconds, that then the algorithm starts saying, "Oh, I'm going to put more of that content there. I'm going to give that kid all that content." So they can be regulated. This this work that we're doing with parents. We're trying to pressure them. We're going to try to do it through pension systems. We're going to try to do it through other ways. We have to pressure them to be their better angels, not just make money. Very quickly, the last time you were on this program, we talked about Mike Pompeo calling you the most dangerous <laughs> person in the world. What's been the reaction to that? So let me just say this. Our union is growing by leaps and bounds. And part of that is that young people really want to be involved in a labor movement. They see that that creates some power for them to have a better life. Um, you see it with UPS. You see it with you know what the the huge fight that's going on with the writers and the and, and the actors. But for us, this year from January to now, fifty five new locals, 55 new units, people who voted for a union. So what it's saying is that we are trying to create solutions. And parents, this is what parents and teachers want. They don't want the politics in schools. They want us to actually help kids. They want families to actually have a better life. So what Pompeo did has completely backfired in terms of where um, regular folks want to go. Um, and so I'm just a happy warrior. And they want to smear me, I'm going to come up with more solutions. They want to try to silence me, we're going to tell the stories of educators and kids. Randy Weingarten, thank you for joining us, the president of the American Federation of Teachers. Coming up next, my thoughts on Labor Day. Monday is Labor Day, but there'll be no Labor Day parade in Manhattan that day. After all, workers are supposed to have the day off. So why dragoon them into traipsing up Fifth Avenue on their day off? Organized Labor's holiday began more ceremoniously. Versions vary, but in 1882, either Peter J. McGuire, a New York carpenter, or Matthew McGuire, a machinist and secretary of the Central Labor Union, inspired the celebration. Both were avowed socialists, another historical fact we conveniently forget. New York was the first state to introduce legislation honoring working people and confirming the growing political power of organized labor by granting them a holiday on the first Monday in September. Also, the first Labor Day parade was held in New York. Some 10,000 people skipped work. Whether any of them would rather have been at the beach or a barbecue or a baseball game doesn't seem to have been recorded. Neither was the number who actually went to the beach or a barbecue or a baseball game instead of assembling at Union Square for speechifying refreshments and fireworks. That the first Labor Day was celebrated in Union Square is another anomaly. The square's name was not derived from any connection to working people, organized labor, or unions. Originally, the only union the square evoked 
was the junction of what became Broadway and Fourth Avenue. Municipal unions won big when Mayor Wagner awarded them collective bargaining rights. But by the centennial of Labor Day, Harry Van Arsdale, the head of the city's Labor Council, had to cool his heels for months before the police department would even grant him a parade permit. Since then, institutional and personal power have diffused further in every sphere. Remember when Woody Allen explained to a future generation that civilization had been destroyed because a man by the name of Albert Shanker got hold of a nuclear warhead? Names like Shanker, or Van Arsdale, Gottbaum, Delury, Quill, have few modern equivalents. Sure, locals like 1199, District Council 37, and the Teachers Union still wield power. And a recent City University report found that New York City leads the nation in a wave of union organizing. But those raw numbers are minuscule. A decade ago, some 24% of wage and salary workers in the city were union members. In the latest count, only 18% were. If they're not at the beach or a barbecue or a ball game, you might see some of them marching up Fifth Avenue for a belated Labor Day parade on September 9th. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.